Ok. Let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for community event call. Uh, we have a fantastic panel of speakers lined up to share some interesting insights on how to scale up uh, crisis reporting platform for larger, more diverse communities. Um, I'll kick us off with some ground rules. Uh, as you'll notice, we have only voice enabled for our panelists. However, we have a chat functionality built into the platform. Uh, so please feel free to share a note with everyone saying hello uh, and where you're going from. Uh, we are going to have some space to fill questions from the audience towards the tail end of the discussion. Uh, so feel free to use the, the chat uh, section to type out any questions you may have for the, for the speakers and in this case teams. Uh, my only request is that you make sure that while tapping the question, you have selected the name of the team, and I'll be able to direct the questions to the team as they stream in. Um, as always, our, all our engagements on Ushahidi platform are guided by our code of conduct, and we ask you to adhere to them. Um, so yes, I'm hoping you're going to have a fun call today uh, to, get, to, to get all the insights from uh, our amazing speakers today. So let's get started. Um, Ushahidi's goal is to empower communities to thrive as a result of access to data and technology. Uh, we empower ordinary people to become active participants in story being told about them and create a bottom up approach to information sharing. Um, so our focus, uh, our work focuses on four impact areas, uh, that is humanitarian disaster relief, uh, human rights protection, um, good governance and climate action. Uh, our ultimate goal we are chasing is systematic change in the quest for social justice. And all we want is citizens to feel more included, organizations to be more effective, policies and decisions made more inclusive and representative, representative of the needs of the ordinary people. And, the, and of course, uh, the most important to me, being the community advocate for our open source community strengthened. Um, Ushahidi encourages contribution from a diverse range of individuals. In this case, we are working with amazing talents from a community program in different avenues of contribution, namely uh, QA, uh, documentation, code, and analysis. We'll be sharing insights on expanding the platform's global reach with a focus of, on, on and, and a deserved and uh, diverse population and exploring potential solutions. Um, so to kick us off, we have the docs teams who have been working closely with amazing team. Uh, so go ahead, um, Shalina Blessing. Hello everyone, I'm Shalini, presenting a dog team today. I hope everyone can see my screen. So let's we can. start, let me start the, the presentation. It's on scaling with clarity, the power of documentation in the global crisis reporting. Now let me introduce with my teammates. It's me, Shalini, and then the blessing, Joy, and then Anushka. So for today, our agenda is we will be going through the introduction, the challenges in the scaling crisis platform, and the role of documentation. Then we will also see how we are building a documentation for a diverse community, and then we will move to the future strategies, and then finally to the conclusion. So let me introduce to you all guys what is the topic. So the platform like Ushadis is expanding globally day by day. So it faces lots of problems and lots of challenges. To cope up these challenges, how documentation plays important role, we will go through that. And what kind of challenges Ushadis really face, we will also go through them. And we will also see how we are building a documentation for the different kind of communities. Let's move to the challenges and scaling crisis reporting platform. Let's go. Hi everyone, my name is Blessing and I will be talking on challenges and scaling crisis reporting platform. Scaling crisis reporting platforms like Ushaidi present several significant challenges, especially as these platforms expand to reach a more diverse and global community. The first challenge is data management. Crisis reporting platforms and those reports from multiple sources and this includes SMS, websites, and social media. And as this platform scale to larger communities, integrating diverse data streams becomes even more complex. And this in turn requires 
robust systems to manage and verify information. Another challenge is ensuring that the platform remains accessible to a wide range of users. Because as we scale, we need to consider differences in technical literacy, for example, our non-technical users, language translation, and even access to technology in general. For instance, a platform that works well for urban users with high-speed internet might not be as effective for those in remote or crisis-affected regions with limited connectivity. So when it comes to documentation and even other aspects of tech, there is the need for integrating different accessibility systems and ensuring inclusiveness for all. Additionally, as crisis reporting platforms like Ushahidi scale, one of the key challenges is maintaining data accuracy and trust because these platforms rely on in, inform, in, information coming in to provide real-time insights during crisis. And as the platform grows, it accepts an increasing volume of data from various sources. And this data can range from highly relevant to irrelevant, and even in some cases, false information. Just imagine a situation where decisions are made based on inaccurate or false reports. This could actually have serious consequences, especially during crisis situation where timely and reliable data is crucial for effective response. The challenge then is to create a system that can screen reports and ensure that information flowing in through the platform is trustworthy and accurate. Thank you. Now let's move to the role of documentation in scaling a crisis reporting platform. Documentation plays a very important role for scalable and accessible to everyone and every community. Now, but let us see how it's supported. One of the important thing is standardizing onboarding. Clear and the structured documentation help a user to understand the thing easily and adapt the shadi easily. For example, like working on my documentation time, I worked on the survey form. So the important information like during a flood, how user can make the form and how user can work through the form. I was documenting that and that helped us shadis and the users adopt those shadis for a longer period. Let's move to localized solution. One of my teammates work on the translation of the documentation so that the people from the different background can understand the shadis and can adopt the shadi easily. Now let's move to the seamless integration. We have also documented things how we can integrate the shadis with different communication apps like WhatsApp and SMS. How shadis can be easily implemented so we also work through that. Then we are working on empowering a local partner. Our documentations are so easy that the user from a different background can understand and use it. We make sure that people don't need to be a technically strong so to understand the documentation. Documentations are quite easy and understandable. Then we also make sure consistency in user experience. Our documents are such a way that users adapt our shadis for a longer period. They stay with the shadis for a long time. Let's move to my personal experience. During my personal experience, during outreach, I faced some kind of challenges while setting out shadis in my local system. It was due to missing of some documentation. There I realized the importance of documentation and our teammates together worked to fulfill that gap. So this way, documentation is not only drives scalability, but also empowers the user, making the platform more inclusive and accessible to the community across the globe. Now let's move to the documentation for a diverse community. Here we will see how we support the documentation for the different kind of community. Like we also support our multilingual support. We make sure that the documentations are for the different language so that from different countries can use our shadis. We also include a real life examples and case study. Our documents have a real life example, such as I gave in the flood examples or any crisis faced by the users. Collaborators and the feedback loop, we make sure to take a regular basis of feedback so that documentation is as per the user requirement. Inclusive of visual representation, we also add the video clip in the documentation so that users who don't want to read lots of things can see the video clip and understand the things. Sometimes understanding from the videos are more easier than reading the documentation. We also make sure to do that. Now let's, let's think. Now, scaling crisis reporting platform, the future. Next slide, please. The future strategies for scaling documentation. As we think about the future, scaling documentation effectively is key to ensuring that as platforms like Ushahidi grow, they remain clear, 
accessible and supportive to a global audience. Some of these strategies include one, automated translation and localization. By implementing automated translation tools, we can provide content in multiple languages while also localizing examples and references to be culturally relevant. Imagine a user in Nigeria accessing the same guide as someone in Kenya, but in their own language and context. This does not only bridge language barriers, but also ensures that the content is relevant to different communities. Next, we have user-generated contributions. Crowdsourcing documentation through user contributions allows us to tap into the diverse expertise of the community. And by empowering users to share their knowledge, we create more robust and real-time updated content. Another very important strategy is the mobile-first documentation. This is given that many users in crisis situations rely on mobile devices, and it is vital to ensure our documentation is mobile-friendly. This means that there is easy navigation, easy navigation and access even in low bandwidth situations for our users. Other strategies include interactive and media documentation by providing video tutorials, infographics, and interactive guides, guides which help to cater for different learning styles. We also have AI-powered search and personalization and inclusive documentation practices. Next slide, please. In conclusion, as we scale, our documentation needs to empower growth by being clear for a global audience, accessible to everyone, and available in multiple learning formats. By focusing on inclusive design and maintaining adaptability, we can sustain growth while ensuring that users, no matter their background or abilities, have the tools they need to engage effectively with the platform. Imagine a future where someone from any part of the world with any level of technical skill can easily access and contribute to the platform. That is the power of scaling documentation. Thank you. From the docs team. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Shalini, and Blessing. Um, part of my role is to ensure that our platform is very easy to use, and documentation plays a key vital role in this. So thank you so much, uh, the docs team, for supporting us in this particular uh, section when it comes to supporting our users. Um, so next up, we have the core team, who have done a great job during this program that will scale up our reporting for a diverse community. So, Zoo? Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Fan Yushu from the coding team, and I'm very happy to do this presentation. Now I'm going to start. The topic of my presentation is how to scale crisis reporting platform for larger, more diverse communities. So let's start by thinking about why we need to scale this platform. Well, I believe uh, there are two key reasons. First of all, the crisis reporting platform play an important role in strengthening communities by enhancing communication and sharing information. Secondly, I think it is important to give users more options for, submit, uh, for submitting reports. By doing so, this platform will collect a wide variety of uh, report, and we can use it to do better analysis. This helps platform respond more effectively and assist more people during crisis. So now let's talk about how to scale the platform. From a coding perspective, I believe one of the quickest way to scale is, is to connect with multiple uh, third-party applications and the service. Because there are already many well-established applications with large communities and the rich data. So by leveraging those existing resources, the platform does not need to develop new tools or applications to reach the users. Instead, we can simply connect to those third-party applications, gather their crisis-related information, and integrate into a platform. This approach, this approach not only reduces development cost, but also enables fast deployment 
to a wide range of communities. So, of course, there are some challenges if we want to uh, scale in this way. And I think one of the biggest challenges is dealing with different API requirements. Let me brief exp explain what is the API is. The API stands for Application Programming Interface, and it is essentially a set of rules that allow different software systems to communicate with each other. So that means each third-party application may have its own unique API structure, which makes the connection more complex. I think another key challenge is the data security concern. As we collect and process the sensitive information from users, we must ensure that all data is kept security. And lastly, I think the filtering information is critical because with the data floating from various sources, we need to filter it effectively to ensure that only relevant, high quality information is processed and analyzed. So, to address those challenges, I proposed a middleware, uh, a middleware service to solution. Um, this tool will allow us to connect different APIs while maintaining high security standards. It will also help manage varying API formats and filter the data efficiently. So why this solution? Is achievable. Uh, let me explain. It's, let me explain why um, this middleware built using the microservice architecture, and it is not only achievable but also scalable and flexible for the future needs. And in the over past few months in the community, I have developed a middleware that connect our uh, cycle, uh, our our circle. Uh, reporting platform with the uh, external service successfully. Now this middleware can handle basic data transformation feature and its foundation is uh, microservice architecture. So why I choose the microservice architecture? So, and why it's so effective for a scalable uh, system solution? There are three reasons. First of all, is an independent service. So each component of the system is built as an independent microservice. So for example, the data transformation service is completely independent from the other data filtering or the security service. This means we can work on or update or scale individual parts of the system without affecting the rest. Secondly, it's a seamless integration. Uh, microservice make it easier to integrate external service because each service can focus on specific tasks like handling API calls, data transformation, or security. This modularity enables us to manage the integration of various, uh, API, various API efficiently, regardless of uh, complex or difference in their formats. Thirdly, I think it's a future-proof flexibility. The microservice architecture also allows us to add a new feature or service in the future. For example, we can, we can easily introduce new external service or advanced security feature without needing to rework the entire system. This makes the system adapt adaptable to the future needs. Then I will also want to talk about the scalability. The microservice are inherently scalable, which is important when dealing with crisis reporting platform that many experiments sudden surgery in data traffic during the uh, emergency. If, your, if our platform needed to handle a high volume of reports during a, disaster, during a disaster, we can scale specific service like the data collection or the processing without scaling the entire system. So for example, if we can, we can scale up the data processing microservice during the time of high demand, and we can keep other service running as the normal. 
So this level of scalability ensures that the system can respond to large crises without overloading or slowing down. So in conclusion, scaling a crisis reporting platform is not just about handling more data. It's about enhanced community engagement, improving response time, and ensure the platform remains flexible and adaptable for the future challenges. The step we have done is developing a middleware, ensure similar API integration and a design for future scalability. Uh, now, I think there are the key milestones towards making the platform capable of helping more people during critical moments. That is all my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Zhu. I, I just recently learned about um, the core functionalities and how the microservices, you don't have to load it into the core functionality of the whole system and how it is very important to make sure that you can still make the, the, the platform scalable, but still making sure the performance does is not affected, which is what you recently have done with your work and it's amazing. So thank you so much, Zoo. Um, so with code and anything technical, it is important to have a team that ensures the stability and security of any product. So this team ensures that. So the flow Hello everyone, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right, hello everyone. My name is uh, Adina and I'm co-presenting today with Felicity and we're both contributors to the QA team, the quality assurance team at the Shahidi, presenting on the role of quality assurance in scaling crisis reporting platforms like the Shahidi to more diverse communities. Uh, to begin, Ushahidi is an open source software application that leverages user-generated reports to map data, serving as a model for activists and humanitarian mapping. Quality assurance, next slide please. Quality assurance is an integral part of the software development lifecycle of Ushahidi's platform. And in the quality assurance team, our role extends beyond merely identifying bugs. We are the backbone of ensuring the platform's scalability, its security, its accessibility, and its optimal performance across various environments. And with our role becoming more crucial in maintaining the platform's viability as it evolves and as the user base grows. And you know, consequently, we yeah. as a department face a handful of hurdles or challenges, as you may say amongst which we have the issue of the expanding of, of expanding the platform's reach to more communities without compromising um, scalability whilst maintaining quality and responsiveness. Um, there's also the issue of ensuring there also there's also the issue of ensuring the integrity or reliability or the trustworthiness of user data and content. And there's also the issue of breaking language barriers and cultural differences to serve a more global audience. And, you know, equally being able to keep up with the fast changing requirements, which can lead to incomplete coverage. Next slide, please. And some of our roles include, uh, firstly, continually monitoring and the platform's functionality, its user experience and evaluating data inputs. Uh, secondly, implementing collaborative testing to address issues earlier on involving diverse user groups to make sure that we get the most out of everybody's experience and also leveraging user feedback to enhance the platform and equally establishing um, robust QA protocols to ensure data integrity and reliability. Next slide. We can be able to expand our footprint to serve diverse communities by enforcing multilingual support, by engaging volunteers to provide uh, translation and cultural context to be used in um, development and testing the platform in multiple languages. Also by incorporating user feedback from various demographics to create a more inclusive design and a more intuitive design. 
and equally empowering local users to participate in the QA process, fostering a sense of shared responsibility for Ushahidi's success. Over to you, Felicity. Okay, hi, can you confirm me, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so one of our roles as QA is to safeguard data integrity in crisis reporting. And there are a number of ways where we're able to, how we're able to verify that the data is, is um, yeah, it's correct. So number one, we have verification. So this is where we implement robust mechanisms to sort of validate that the data that user submit is authentic and it's accurate. And the next step would be to triangulate by like cross-referencing multiple sources to confirm that the information and identify potential discrepancies. And then we have the secure storage where we ensure that the, where we ensure the confidentiality and protection of sensitive data throughout the reporting life cycle. And yes, um, also bridging language and cultural divides. Number one is like multilingual support. So we, we, we try to provide seamless translation services to enable communication across language barriers. So Shahidi has already like been interpreted in several other languages. So this is us trying to try to bridge um, the language barrier a bit by you know, having multilingual support. And then cultural sensitivity, where we try to foster a deep understanding of local customs, their beliefs and norms to ensure that um, we have culturally appropriate interactions. And then we have community collaboration which involves engaging local volunteers and stakeholders to serve as cultural ambassadors and moderators. And then there is the inclusive design where we try to tailor, uh, tailor Ushahidi's user experience to accommodate diverse needs and preferences. So um, we also have um, optimizing user experience for global audiences. And then we have um, inti intuitive navigation. So this is where we try to, this is where we streamline reporting workflows are easy to understand and use. Example would be being able to report an issue through um, SMS and then having accessible design. So um, when we come to software, we have to ensure that it is really accessible, especially to people that are sort of using um, assistive devices and then technologies and also accommodate users with diverse abilities. And localized content is the adapting the platform language, the visuals, the contextual information to sort of suit um, local preferences and norms. And then seamless feedback is a way of providing multiple channels for users to submit suggestions and report issues with timely responses. And then quality assurance, the linchpin of scalable, secure, scalable crisis reporting. So number one, will drive platform growth. So quality assurance is essential for expanding crisis reporting platforms to serve larger and more diverse communities. Because QA is basically just ensuring that this product is ready, is scalable for user consumption. So that's where we come in. And then we also ensure data integrity where we have processes to safeguard the reliability and trustworthiness of user-generated content. You want to be sure that the information a user is providing is actually authentic and reliable. And then we also help to optimize the platform's accessibility, usability, and cultural relevance for global audiences. So we perform a sort of um, regression testing where we try to ensure that every feature on the platform works as it should. So we test it as a user to ensure that things work as they should on the user experience side. And then we also have an in, um, support and iterative approach where we drive ongoing enhancement based on user feedback and evolving needs. So when we get users feedback and our, um, our results from our testing, we are able to use an iterative approach to you know, share the feedback with the team and have them build up on that to improve it, thereby like improving the user's experience. And then we also ensure cross-platform compatibility by testing the platform on a variety of devices to ensure that we try to cover as much devices as we can to ensure that a user, um, regardless of their device, is able to like have the optimal experience using Ushahidi. And then we test through um, different operating systems and browsers to ensure compatibility. And then we expand the platform's usability across different environments, making it accessible to users, regardless of their device or OS. So um, things we can do for the future to expand the QA footprint and serve diverse communities would be um, delving into like more sophisticated testing practices, which involves localization, globalization testing, um, performance and scalability testing, accessibility testing, very important. 
security and compliance testing, user experience testing, regression testing to maintain quality. And then we also do integration testing with third party service. And then um, training local moderators would be like equipping community members with the skills to identify and flag inaccurate or harmful content in their local languages and context. And then developing cultural sensitive guidelines. So we're sort of creating a comprehensive QA policies that align with diverse cultural norms and respects local sensitivities, building regional QA hubs, may seem like a stretch, but um, establishing localized QA teams to address the specific needs and challenges of different communities. And then we'll, we are also able to leverage community feedback by implementing systems for gathering user feedback. And we just ensure that when we get this feedback, we incorporate it into the QA process to ensure responsiveness to evolving needs of the users. So um, thank you very much. That would be all from our end and we're open to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Felicity and Adina. We will have uh, questions at the end of the discussion. I can see you already have one question so you can uh, prepare to answer that um, at the end of the of this discussion. So, and, and again, I think we all agree that this team is very important, especially uh, Ushahidi being a tech organization, uh, because we all know, uh, we all use uh, digital tools and communicate our work, and we complain when things are not working. So I, I'm hoping we all know uh, which team to look at with ciders when it comes to this particular situation. When we do, we are hoping that, you know, they will always be very ready to respond and <laughs> help fix these bugs. Um, so yes, thank you so much, uh, QA. Uh, last but not least, we have analysis. Uh, as I mentioned, Ushahidi's uh, ultimate goal we are chasing is systematic change in the quest for social justice. And for that to happen, policies and decisions made should be more inclusive and representative of the needs of the ordinary people. So this is hugely supported by generated insights from uh, the data collected, even in our platforms or any other platform. So we'll have Ilma take us through analysis and its importance. Go ahead, Ilma. Thank you, Ilma. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi everyone, my name is Ruma Sasabal. I'm a data analyst and passionate contributor to Shahidi. Today I'm excited to talk about how data analysis transform uh, crisis reporting. The best part, you don't need to be an uh, expert in coding, just curiosity and a desire to help during uh, critical times are enough. Now, why data is important in crisis reporting? Uh, let's start with it. Uh, imagine a natural disaster like a flood. You might report rising water levels in your area or even call for help if people are trapped. But how do responders decide where to act first? That's where data analysis comes in. As a data analyst, uh, you can process these reports and identify patterns, helping responders allocate resources efficiently instead of guessing uh, determine which areas variety of reports we ensure that the most urgent needs are prioritized. Let's uh, let me give you an example. It's a real world example during Hurricane Helene. Flood reports were pouring in from different regions. With data analysis, you prioritize regions with higher water levels uh, and more people in need of rescue. This made sure that life-saving resources reached those who needed them in most and fast. Without this data-driven approach, relief efforts could have been delayed or misdirected. To make this process more efficient, I developed a tool called Data Analysis Toolbot. This tool automates much of the data analysis, helping us quickly clean, analyze, and report on crisis data. It's all about making the right decision at the right time. The key features of this data analysis toolbot are, it handles messy data, so it's ready for analysis. Data set splitting, uh, perfect for machine learning models if needed, and breaking down text for natural language processing tasks. Then you can identify critical patterns and trends by using this tool, toolkit, 
and it creates clean, comprehensive reports so that stakeholders can easily understand the findings. During this pilot program, I use the data analysis toolbot in two real world applications, Twitter sentiment analysis and survey analysis. For Twitter sentiment analysis, the tool helped me guide, uh, guide public re reactions uh, during crisis. It analyzed tweets and visualized trends in real time, giving actionable insights into public sentiment. This was crucial in shaping how relief efforts were communicated. For survey analysis, the tool clean it and structure the data collected from crisis relief reports. It then generated professional reports summarizing the key insights which help decision makers quickly understand the most important trends. Now, why data analysis is important for decision making? First, it helped make data-driven decisions and like where to send resources first. And it also gives a full picture. We can clearly see the most affected areas and respond with exactly what is needed, whether it's food, rescue teams, or medical supplies. Using template to make life easier, one thing that helps streamline this process is using data analysis template. Templates provide structure for tasks like data cleaning, data visualization, insights generation, and so on. Uh, they ensure consistency and save time, which is critical during emergencies. How I use my templates. In my own work, I use templates for data collection, guidelines for gathering data, preparing the raw data, turning data into graphs to highlight key areas, drawing meaningful conclusions from the trends. Now, data analysis also helps in few specific ways. It tells us which communities need more attention, and we can customize our help based on each area's need. And also, as data grows, analysis helps maintain an organized, efficient response. The key indicators to consider a flood crisis. In a flood crisis, there are a few key indicators to focus on. The first one is report volume. Tell us where the most activity is happening. Also the location, identifying hotspots um, helps direct resource to the worst hit areas. And some reports may indicate life threatening situations. By prioritizing this, we make sure help arrives where it's needed the most. And finally, thank you for joining me today. I hope this uh, gives you a better understanding of how data analysis transform crisis reporting. And if you have any questions and want to dive deeper into how this can be applied, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ilma and everyone else. Um, I, I think um, looking at these presentations and seeing the people who are working to help us uh, scale up our, our platform, um, you can see the work that they have put in it uh, in different kinds of things when it comes to, to documentation and try to support the, our users and how they can easily um, navigate our platform and even circumvent things like language barriers and things like that. And when it comes to QA, trying to just help us um, ensuring that the stability of the product that will always be one of the things that we take care of and helping us fix this kind of things to just uh, fix the loopholes that we might have when we are supporting our people. And then we have code uh, who are innovating in things that will help our users just to be able to reach uh, their communities uh, via different kinds of data sources that is accessible to them. So this is, I think this is amazing work. And then now we have uh, Ilman because at the end of the day, once you have all this data collected, you have to generate insights. And Ilma is, is working on how to um, support people and how they can do that when it comes to documenting uh, how people can clean up their data, how people can generate insights. And you have heard that she has actually mentioned that she she built a tool bot that 
really helps in doing all of this. And this will be available uh, for our users um, because she will be documenting all of this and trying to just support our users to generate insights from all the data that they're collecting from, from, their, from their communities to inform decisions. So um, I love this community. Uh, I, I can't say that enough. Um, they're doing an amazing work and they will continuously try to just support the community as a whole and even their communities uh, based on what they're learning and hoping. And now we can go to questions. If you have questions, uh, I can see there are a couple of questions. So uh, Rose, you can direct the questions to the relevant teams. Hi, everyone. So I think my first question is actually in the chats for the QA team. I understand there's a part you talked about uh, the cross-referencing, you know, uh, sources to see if there are any disparities. You know, you you call this triangulation, I think. So, so is this done with any tool? And if yes, could you provide an example of such a tool? Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Tina, I do know you're muted. Rose. Yeah, yeah, um, sorry about that. I was trying to get live. Okay, um, Rose, thank you for your question. Yeah, we did mention the aspect of triangulation where we try to cross reference um, data from multiple sources and to check if there are any uh, discrepancies in the data. Uh, so uh, basically we can do that manually and we can do that with tools. There are tools that exist to uh, check for discrepancies. We have API tools like Postman or SOAP UI that we can use to check if you know data are not aligned like like if to check whether or not the data is um, the, the response to data or let's say the, the, the response to how a particular functionality is supposed to perform is the same as the expected um, outcome. And before we even get to checking whether manually or with the tools, we have to first of all outline their best practices. First of all, we have to identify the key parameters, which are the, the, the fields or attributes that we, we we really want to match across these different sources and you know make sure investigate the root causes and check the latest documentation for these um different APIs in the case we were performing um cross references for API. So basically it can be done manually and it can be done with our uh, tools. There are API tools for that. There are also um data reconciliation tools. There are there are a lot of automation frameworks that can be used like say Selenium or Cucuba. So it also it varies on the type of you know um, cross referencing and the entity you're trying to cross reference and also what kind of functionality it is. You need to have you need to set your base criteria for exactly what you're checking and make sure that the expected outcome and the actual outcome are the same. So that's where the aspect of triangulation comes in because it's it's like a, a bridge between so many factors that exist on the pyramid. I don't know if you if I answered your question. Yeah, you have. Uh, do I continue, Cecilia? Yes, yes. Okay. So I think the last question is uh maybe I'll have a question for the documentation team. So the other question is to the data analysis team. Now, I'm so curious to have seen the bot that cleans, you know, splits, does a lot of things at the same time. So I'm curious uh, to know if it's available, if we can try it out. And now maybe this is something you can answer based on how you built the bot. How did you ensure that it gives the accurate report, it does the right thing when it comes to even cleaning the data? doesn't get, get rid of, you know, the important data, it cleans it well, splits well, yeah. Thank you for your question, Ruth. Uh, yes, data analysis toolbot is publicly available for everyone to use, and it was designed to help uh, simplify data analysis, particularly in crisis situation, and it's accessible to anyone who wants to harness its capabilities. And to ensure the tool it's accurate um, and avoids generating incorrect or hallucinated reports, 
we have, I have implemented several key uh, measures, the data validation and cleaning. The tool, um, the tool performs comprehensive data validation and cleaning before any analysis, ensuring that only accurate and relevant data is pre-processed. And uh, while it uses AI for certain tasks, much of the data handling like tokenization and report generation relies on structured rule-based algorithms. Uh, this ensures consistency and reduce the risk of errors. Uh, the board is continuously improved through feedback loops and updates. And I will also add uh, complex features as well. So it's designed to allow human analysts to review and verify reports if needed. And this human in the loop process helps refine its uh, insights it generates. Yeah. Thank you. I'll be so happy to I, try I it. I can't wait to use same yeah i can act, i can't actually wait to to try your tool tool board yeah. yeah yeah i think the last question now is uh to the documentation team i know you have talked about uh you know how you can scale is integrating that party um, apps right so i'm um, just curious uh, some of the tools or some of the applications, third party applications you have come across, you have used. This is to the documentation team. Yeah. Let me know if you have uh, understood my question. Do you have Shalini or Joy or Lesson? Okay, so um, for scaling the documentation, when it comes to translation, for example, um, some of the tools I've used in translating documents from third party tools um, include Google Docs. I use Google Docs for translation. I also use Google Translate for translating documents. Yeah, when it comes to processes for translating. Uh, while creating documentation for the survey forms, uh, for creating a clip, we have used video clipping app for creating a video. It was a, uh, so which we can create the video and edit the voice in AI so that the essence of the voice is quite understandable to different communities. So we have used that tool for better understanding. So one of the tools is used, screen recording tools are being used, so video editing tools are used. And these are the tools we have used while documenting so that everybody can understand the thing. Hope that makes sense. So, thanks. Is that okay, uh, Rose? Have they, have they answered you? your question oh yeah i was speaking on mute sorry yeah they have they have i uh, i have a question for 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 the core team if you don't have any more questions i had a comment but it's okay you can go on okay no 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 go ahead uh so it this is just a comment uh to the code team uh, I really appreciate how you've, uh, you know, talked about and even thought about how you can handle high traffic. Now that we are scaling to a wider, uh, rather uh, diverse uh, and a huge number of users. And high traffic is something that, you know, we have to make sure that we've uh, put it in mind so that we can... Uh, uh, be sure how we are going to manage the increased user loads and uh, let the number of uh, user not affect how our platform uh, works. Uh, uh, thank you for your question. So that is the reason why we want to use the microservice architecture. That is if like if you have uh, like the higher demand of the user, uh, 
user, uh, you can you can just scale the like the user's database, and you, then you can get more the uh, you cannot to scale all the systems database. You can just to scale like the uh, a part of uh, a part of database, like is the part of like the user's database. But if you want to uh, scale, if you have lots of report want to dealing with, you can just to scale the uh, uh, report database. So that is the solution of the uh, of the scaling data problem. You want to say that uh, Jacinda? Thank you. Sir. Izu or Jacinda, because I can see uh, Jacinda just mentioned that uh, for the new Microsoft, we will scale it up with the help of Kubernetes. I'm not a, a, a techie, so I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Um, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, actually, Kubernetes is a scaling uh, platform that we can use to scale up some spe uh, specific microservice or whatever, uh, uh, you know, application that we want to scale up. So as you know, there uh, some people only needs the feature to, you know, fill the uh, fill the survey forms with the help of WhatsApp forms. So uh, we all, uh, we don't need to scale the whole platform as it will cost us too much to scale the whole platform. But instead of that, we will only scale the new service that will help us to you know integrate the WhatsApp forms to the uh, uh, to the old legacy service of the UCI So. Uh, that will save our cost and we can only, you know, uh, create a single instance with a single threaded uh, micro micro instance from AWS or any other uh, cloud engine. And that will cost us less and it will be efficient solution. So that's why we chose a microservice and uh, we created a new microservice there. Would you say that this helps? Uh, complexity when it comes to testing and quality assurance in case something happens um, that affects the product or the product faces issues that this lessen the work when it comes to that for that particular team would you say that yeah so uh, as this is a some separate this is a sep uh, separate part of the code base uh, this is not inside the legacy code base this is just a new service that we introduced so whatever effect it will have the direct, uh, developers can directly go to this specific code base and fix it out. It will not uh, affect any existing code base. It is separate thing. I think the QA team at this point will be smiling because I can't imagine if everything is under one system and something affects it they have to make sure that the whole system continues functioning and still not mess it up when it comes to fixing that one specific thing so i think microsoft is is something that you know would make sure the performance of any product is still okay even when things happen because we all know things happen um so any questions from the rest of the team too any of the other teams? Cool. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for everyone um, who has presented and has been part of any of the teams. Thank you so much. Um, I think what, what I would actually like to close uh, the meeting with is um you can contribute to shahidi in different avenues of of contributions and this is code documentation testing design and analysis and you have already had of uh from all these teams apart from design uh but this is how you can take part uh, and be part of the community uh, and just help us support uh, different uh, communities all over the world to scale up uh, our platform. So in case you want to to just be part of the community, this is how you can you can contribute to to any 
um, when it comes to your expertise and your skills. Um, just to, we have a community uh, uh, Discord uh, space where you'll find all these amazing presenters uh, there who will be able to support you and answer any of your questions later on. So feel free to, to just um, join our community. We, we welcome people. I'm, I'm hoping they all felt welcomed when they first joined uh, our community. Um, so you can just use the QR code to just uh, join uh, to find uh, our community. And just to stay informed, uh, about Ushahidi, we have the um, we have GitHub where we um, where all the the tickets or anything related to to tech and other avenues of contributions you can find all that in GitHub. Again, we are open source, so in case you want to host um, the deployment in your own servers, you can find the source code in GitHub. Uh, you can find us on Twitter to just get informed on any kind of um, uh, anything that we are involved in when it comes to Ushahidi or the community itself, we have Facebook and then we have Instagram. So just to, um, yeah, stay informed and be part of us. Um, thank you so much, um, everyone. And I wish all of you the best and hope to see you in our community. Thank you so much. <laughs>